Hey, I'm Jalamoth, the curator of all things curious, and just like my title implies, I'm here to document and preserve everything I find exceptionally interesting. This time being the mysteries of Jujutsu Kaisen, the Odyssean epic by mangaka Gege Akutami, and also, believe it or not, the only anime about young teens with powers. Hey, well, what about my hero? Ignore that. I'm gonna go ahead and assume you know how an iceberg video works, but it's basically just an excuse to have dozens of schizophrenic rants about the same thing. Today, we'll be breaking down a ton of creepy ideas and theories about all your favorite sorcerers. We got Eugene, Megan, No Bra, Gojo, fuck it, we got them all. If you're an anime only who cares about spoilers, this is not the video for you. This iceberg I put together goes so hard it's gonna spoil the manga fans, okay? Alright, enough of this. This first entry, Sukuna's Corpse, is in reference to the opening pages of Chapter 1, where we first get this double-page spread of our main cast as a title, title card. card! This mummified body in the background is the cadaver of none other than the King of Curses, Ryomen Sukuna. This is intriguing to me, as his body has never been shown again or even brought up. We know Sukuna was quote-unquote defeated by the powerful sorcerers of the Heian era, which he reigned. We also know his fingers became cursed objects and thus survived all those years. But what's surprising is that the rest of his corpse is this preserved. I mean, didn't he get decimated by the Hagen era sorcerers? We can tell it's him for sure because of these eye slits here, but something I thought was interesting was that these holes seem to only be on the left half of his face. We've seen flashbacks of Sukuna in his prime, in his terrifying original form, and he's repeatedly pictured with this mask covering the right side of his face. So maybe Sukuna wasn't four-eyed like we think he was, and perhaps still only had two eyes, but they were both just only on the left side of his face, which is potentially why he wore this mask. Cursed energy traits are a rare phenomena in Jujutsu where some individuals have abnormal cursed energy, unique to them. I mean the aura that emanates around them when using cursed energy is fundamentally different. The only two real examples we have of this so far are Kashimo and Hikari. As described to us by Yuji as he was being brutalized mid-fight, Hikari's cursed energy is sharp, it has an edge to it, and being hit by him feels like being slammed with a serrated bat. Not only does this do more damage, but it's also sure to cause a lot of confusion in the enemy, a definite added benefit. The other known cursed energy trait is that of Kashimo, who is being constantly surged with electric cursed energy. Attacking him does damage to the attacker, and he can even arc bolts of cursed energy like lightning, giving him guaranteed hits on victims. A black flash in Jujutsu is when you apply cursed energy to a blow within a millionth of a second after it was delivered. If it does land a millionth of a second later, space itself distorts around your attack like liquid. The cursed energy flashes black and creates a temporal blowback of sorts, multiplying the attack's damage. The mantis shrimp half of this entry comes from the fact that some have hypothesized the inspiration for this attack comes from these humble undersea shrimp. Don't underestimate them though. These guys throw the strongest punch in the animal kingdom in relation to their size. Their attack speed is immense. There's a small but noticeable delay before they do it, and the incredible high-speed movement can even create air bubbles similar to the sort of atmosphere-bending pressure of the Black Flash. This one is pretty simple, it's just questioning the validity of the statement Mahito makes about reverse curse technique that that it cannot heal his idol transfiguration. There's a couple possibilities for this, one being he was telling the truth. The second and more interesting being he thought he was telling the truth, but little known to Mahito, an extremely gifted reverse curse technique user could do it with ease. Someone like Sukuna, who Yuji begs to heal his transfigured frenemy Junpei. Truth is, it's still unknown whether Mahito was telling the truth or just speaking out his ass to intimidate Yuji and slice every thread of hope he had. Surely, though, this will be answered with the conclusion of whatever Nobra is going through. Useless Miwa is a bit of a joke, but more of a premonition for the future. 
Kasumi Miwa is a grade 3 sorcerer and student who knows nothing but taking L's, and she frequently refers to herself as Useless Miwa. Anxious members of the JJK community know that the mangaka of the series, Gege Akutami, has a sick sense of humor and a knack for foreshadowing. This has led some to believe that despite being written off as useless, Miwa will play a monstrously important role within the story. There's a few theories that give this idea more credence further down the iceberg, but as Miwa is currently a player in the Culling Games walking in the destroyed remains of the Sendai colony, I imagine we'll find out her true usefulness or lack thereof rather soon. This entry is just introducing the concept and properties of the Prison Realm, a mystic item that will have more importance the further down we travel. The Prison Realm is a special grade, aka fucking insane, cursed object. The thing is basically like an evil Pokeball. It traps someone inside an inescapable hellish pocket dimension. Its origins are rather murky, but it's an incredibly strong tool in the world of JJK, and Kenjaku uses it to trap Gojo indefinitely during the Shibuya incident. At the point of this video, Gojo has been ensnared inside the prison realm since chapter 91, over 110 chapters ago. At this point, Gojo has spent more of JJK in here than anywhere else combined. Hakari is a shark is a super interesting little collection of details. To start off, Hakari lives and breathes gambling, it even manifests in his domain. A card sharp or card shark in gambling is a dominant and oppressive player who plays quick and uses high skill and deception to get the upper hand. Hikari fits this bill perfectly, and some wonder if there's some sort of connection between this phrase and Hikari's unique sharp cursed energy. Perhaps this specific trait has manifested itself to mimic the sharp and coarse skin of a shark, often said to feel like sandpaper or that it has an edge to it. Pretty familiar. This one is kinda worded poorly, I promise Yuta doesn't have some sort of terminal illness. Yuta's condition just refers to another super simple one that will likely be answered soon within the narrative, that being the condition Yuta needs to achieve to use his copy curse technique. Yuta can copy people's abilities, but we have little to no idea how the mechanics of this ability actually work. Surely Yuta just can't copy the technique of everyone he sees or he would be throwing out hollow purples everywhere. Does he or Rika need to consume part of the host before they can use this ability? Or maybe it's just touching them. Maybe it's how well you know the sorcerer, which is why Yuta is so inquisitive with his enemies during his fights, trying to get them to open up and speak about themselves just so he can fulfill his special condition and diff them using their own powers. I'm not really sure, but I'm excited to see which it is. Hana Kurusu is a teenage girl in the Culling Games who houses a powerful entity inside her called the Angel in a relationship very similar to Yuji and Sukuna's. We're properly introduced to her as she and Angel save Fushiguro's life, and when asked why she did this, Angel interrupts saying they saved him because Hana and him used to... <laughs> Hana cuts the conversation short, clearly insinuating some sort of past relationship between the two. This strange insinuation would be enough to bring up on its own, but some keen-eyed fans remember a flashback all the way back in chapter 59, when Megumi recalls his sister and friends before they went to the Yasuhachi Bridge to get cursed. A short-haired girl flirts with Megumi, then immediately asks if they're still going to the bridge. The truth is, we won't know until it's confirmed or denied, because we do know Fushiguro was canonically pulling mad bitches, so this could greasily just be one of his adoring fans. Sukuna's cannibalism isn't a theory, it's a fact. He sees humanity as cattle and eats them as such. Ura Ume, who's a character we'll talk about sometime later, is someone we barely know anything about. They're over a thousand years old and has seemingly been allied with Sukuna in past eras. The reason I'm bringing them up now is because in the JJK fanbook, when asked about Ura Ume, Gege Akutami responded with this. Sukuna also eats humans, but it's hard to cook them. Or rather, there's very few people with that sort of experience, but Uda Ume is excellent at that skill. I guess. Sukuna's favorite hobby is stated to be eating, and with powerful slicing and cooking abilities, as well as a cute little boyfriend-girlfriend here to freeze all his meat, it's pretty safe to say that Sukuna here enjoys a good human meal. He wouldn't be a famous cannibal for no reason though, so that begs the question, who is gonna get eaten by this dude?
So before we dive deeper to the next layer of topics, I just want to quickly complain about how quick this Gege Akutami guy writes a chapter. These things are out every week and my videos are only out every... Oh man... So you get the idea. I'm gonna have these little intermissions between tiers to break up the pace and also potentially update anything in the video that's already become outdated. For instance, since writing this script, the theory about Sukuna having two eyes has been completely falsified. We've gotten better looks at his face and he's just horribly malformed. Still worthy of mentioning, but I couldn't upload this video without saying something. I'm excited to look back on this video later when JJK is over. This mid-series theorizing will be a total time capsule. But enough hypothetical retromania, let's get into this second domain. Memory manipulation curse technique is one of the most popular JJK theories of all time, but is commonly thought of as just a red herring. It alludes to Yuji's non-existent curse technique, and to the famous moment when Toto chose to not lay Yuji out because of a seemingly random false memory that was implanted in his brain, one of him and Yuji being brothers. These impulsive thoughts were so potent, Toto still to this day believes that he is Yuji's brother, and that they grew up together. A very similar thing happens later in this series when Cursed Womb Chozo suddenly spares Yuji's life because of these same brotherly instincts kicking in. This led many, including myself at the time, to theorize that Yuji has some sort of dormant technique he was unknowingly using, one that implanted sweet memories of himself into his enemies' heads. Further evidence and scarier entries a little bit further down the iceberg debunk this theory in a way though, so stay tuned for that if you want to know why this isn't as plausible as it sounds. Self-awareness domain expansion is a theory about how domains are made, and more specifically, who gets to make one. This idea posits that since domains are the soul being projected into the physical world, the better you know yourself and the more self-aware you are, the stronger and more refined your domain is. That's why we've heard that in a domain battle, where two people cast their domain at once, the more refined domain will win. This might be what that literally means, whoever's domain is a better actualization of their soul. Someone who has a harder time figuring out what they want in life and who they need to be, like Anonymy for example, could never form a domain expansion despite being as strong as he was. But once Megumi realizes his goal and focuses every part of himself on it, he can instantly cast one out. And further still, someone who knows exactly what they want in this life, someone like Gojo, Hikari, or Mahito, have insanely strong and refined domains. This theory goes along perfectly with how emotions fuel cursed energy, and I honestly wouldn't be shocked if this was completely canon. The curse curse is somewhat of a joke slash thought experiment slash paradox. Some curses in JJK are made from specific fears, like how Kuro Rushi is the cockroach curse. All of Japan's accumulated fear of cockroaches is pooled into this one being, making him very strong. This idea just basically states that there may be a curse birthed from the human sphere of curses. This is somewhat of a joke, but you guys aren't going to be laughing when it's revealed that Sukuna is the curse curse. Because for real, I mean, wouldn't that make them like, the strongest curse of them all? Maybe the king of them, perhaps? Hmm? The Sakurajima Volcano is referring to the part of the Culling Games arc starring Maki that takes place during early November 2018 in the Sakurajima Prefecture. On November 13th, 2018, in Sakurajima in real life, a sizable volcanic eruption happened. People believe that Gege may somehow work this into the story, possibly even rebirthing Jogo. I think that this theory is only believed by Jogo copers hoping that this Sukuna victim will be revived sometime in the same era. This theory is exactly what it says, we know very little about Tengen, and it wouldn't be too surprising if it turns out they're evil, or allied with Kenjaku, or Sukuna, or somehow even their own independent force. They've been around for a very long time, and so we know they're very capable, and they had a ton of information that could have aided our characters that they kept to themselves for some reason. Just think about what they aren't saying they know, okay? They're just weird, they're suspect to me. I'm, I'm like 90% sure by the time the story ends, my baby boy Choso is gonna die, and it will be Tengen's fault, I swear to god, mark my words. I'll be here crying when it happens. High human potential is alluding to a single line in chapter 116 where Sukuna says, Humans, Jujutsu sorcerers, cursed spirits, you're not bad compared to those I've fought over the last thousand years. 
This line is interesting because it seems to infer that at one point there were humans dominating the playing field just as there were sorcerers and curses, possibly through heavenly restriction, but what I think is more likely is ancient humans were just badass. This line also seems to imply to me that somehow humans and jujutsu sorcerers are different things, seemingly like how Sukuna transcended being human himself and considers what he does to be real sorcery. After reading the recent fight with Cursed Spirit Noya Zenin, some Digimon fans noticed that his design may likely be based on an old Digimon character in Furmon. This dude has tentacles that retract into a weirdly specific sleek and aerodynamic shape that has a striking resemblance to that of Noya here. I thought this was a little far-fetched at first until I found out that Gege has actually referenced Digimon directly before, and apparently Gojo here is a big fan actually. Black Flash's soul strength is just saying that perhaps the stronger your soul, the more passionate and driven you are, the easier it becomes to land this notorious Black Flash. This link between willpower and Black Flashes can be theorized about when thinking about how they seem to happen in very plot significant moments. Times when the character maybe really needed that Black Flash, or it was just an amazing show of their inner self in general. Black Flashes always seem to happen when the sorcerers are confident, ready, driven. It isn't a random chance, it's the strength of the soul. Maybe that's why this sweet boy can bust them out like they're nothing, because Yuji is all gas and no brakes, this boy is made of passion, in comparison to someone like Nanami. It's incredibly hard for him to hit them regularly, perhaps because he's a very dispassionate person, but he manages in a spontaneous moment of will to pull out four in a row when his students needed to be saved. Very interesting, hmm. There's a panel way back in chapter 12 where Gojo drops the absolute bombshell of a line, before long, your body will be scarred with Sukuna's technique. Now, I think Gojo is a pretty damn reliable source when it comes to all things technique, you know, with his special eyes and all. If this is true and Yuji does eventually learn Sukuna's technique, which mind you, we still don't know, everyone says cleave and dismantle, the slicing attacks are his techniques, but there's clearly more to it as we'll discuss in length later. Sukuna may have the ability to collect or absorb techniques or abilities in some way, or maybe even something entirely different. We have no clue how long it'll be until Yuji gains these abilities, or even how long it'll take to manifest. This line is just wild, and it appears so early in the series, it just gets my head racing. The back of the prison realm has always been something so strange to me. It's pretty shrouded in mystery, but here's what I can tell you about it. First of all, the back isn't literally the back, it's an entirely separate object, functioning as the exit to the prison realm. Similar to how Sukuna's fingers are a cursed object originating from a powerful being, the prison realm is a creation of a figure we've heard about like once or twice called Monk Genshin. Some actually theorize the inside of the prison realm is Monk Genshin's domain, preserved throughout time through this impervious object. Master Tengen tells us that they sealed the back of the prison realm in order to hide it. This didn't work, and Kanjaku apparently found it anyways. This has always rubbed me and a lot of other fans in a really weird way, and honestly sort of seems like it supports the Tengen is sus theory. The back of the prison realm may not even exist, and Tengen is either telling our characters that it does to get them to go fruitlessly risk their lives for his bestie Kenjaku's plan, or maybe it does exist and they just told Kenny here where to find it, or just gave it to him or maybe even made it for the guy, I don't know, I'm just still sussed out by him. A chance meeting with a foolish moth moved him to passion and poetry. Dear boys, I met a moth the other night who loved to play with fire. Before we get into the next tier of the iceberg, and no, don't worry, I don't have a sponsor, I just wanted to thank these guys right here, who graciously, uh, donated their theories to me for this. Some of these are my ideas and general mysteries, but a lot of these came from the really smart and talented people over at r slash jujutsushi, the JJK manga subreddit. The amount of college-level written statements on jujutsu speculation here is just goddamn ridiculous. Every day, dozens of dudes write straight-up thesis papers on this forum and have noticed things no sane human being would've. 
I don't have the time to comb through all of JJK's deepest mysteries and themes for hours and document and format all my thoughts like this, but I did however have the time to comb through this sub, so they're low-key the heroes of this video. I mean, just look at some of this stuff. Ultra Ego Six Eyes Part 2 A discussion on the connections between special bodies and domains and Hikari's domain being based on probability. I could hardly get through that. That sounds like... Hey, I just realized that Gato questioning Gojo's godlike status in Jujutsu society reminisces the dialogue exchange between Socrates and Euthyphro revolving around the gods and pious and pious... Oh, are you for real? I can't take it anymore. Staying on the theme of wild plot developments revealed super early in the story, look no farther than chapter 11. Sukuna gains control of Yuji's body, and rips his own heart out to take Yuji hostage slash straight up kill him. To heal his heart and bring him back to life, Yuji makes a deal with Sukuna, a deal he has no memory at all of making. What Sukuna proposed was a binding vow, one which he'll use reverse curse technique to heal Yuji's heart in exchange for allowing Sukuna to take control of Yuji's body with nothing more than the word in chain. Yuji obviously disagreed harshly, but his opinion was swayed after Sukuna stated he could only do this once, only do it for a single minute, and that in that minute he would kill zero people. The only caveat being Yuji will completely forget he ever made the vow. This will almost surely have insanely large consequences on our characters later down the line. At the worst possible moment, Sukuna will say in chain and commit 60 seconds of pure chaos. It's said multiple times that Yuji is a ticking time bomb. This makes him a ticking time bomb with a fuse loose. Forced evolution is the idea that while in peril or rapid threat of extinction, creatures will forcibly evolve faster than normally possible just to keep up. This is supposedly Kenjaku's goal. He will force the Jujutsu landscape to evolve by pushing it to its limits. By being the biggest menace possible, he's forced our main cast to evolve into beasts. This will come into play later, but I just wanted to get the concept down here. Sukuna's tattoos have caught the attention of many, many people in the mystery sub-community of JJK, and for very good reason. Gege usually has pretty stellar character designs, so them just being for looks definitely is not the case. There are far too many theories to fully discuss here. A full video of time could easily be dedicated to all the different ideas. Some people think Sukuna's tattoos represent body parts that are no longer there. The circles on his shoulders to represent his previous set of arms. The lines on his stomach to represent the gaping maw Sukuna had on his original form stomach. And even the lines on the back corresponding to wings maybe. Now we know Sukuna may have had wings at some point because of his affiliation with the angel. But some believe Sukuna is based on a cherub, meaning he may have had some sort of animal connection to explain these wings. A connection to eagles, lions, and ox to be specific from what I could find. I'm not sure about the lion, but the wings and eagle line up and the ox could be alluding to the horn looking ink he has here on his forehead. Another theory is that in these tattoos, Sukuna stores different curse techniques that he can summon at will. Some think he summons cursed tools from these tattoos. I'll dive deeper into a few of these theories later because they relate to other topics, but for now let's just look at Sukuna. In previous forms, Sukuna was shown to have less tattoos, like here on his arms. Could the extra circle and extra line here be alluding to the lack of arms, or maybe the fact that there is now Sukuna and Yuji's souls within this host? Sukuna could have gained another soul, or collected more OP abilities, or broken weapons, or any other number of sinister things. Well, the whole point of this entry is just calling to light this detail that will likely become very important later. We have no idea what his tattoos are about. This one is a bit much, but I'll try to make it quick. Toji Fushiguro, the man infamous for bringing Satoru Gojo closer to death than any opponent by far, did so using a weapon called the Inverted Spear of Heaven. The Inverted Spear of Heaven, or ISO for short, is a dagger with a very special curse technique imbued into it. This dagger has the ability to nullify curse techniques, meaning it can stab right through Gojo's infinity. We find out from Megami later that Gojo destroyed the ISO, and it was theorized this was because he saw it as a threat. So why is it still relevant in the story? Ever since the first time we saw Toji use it, the ISO has been drawn with the third blade snapped off. My conspiracy theory ass refuses to believe this is any sort of creative decision. 
there is somewhere out there a shard of mystic cursed metal that can slice through even curse techniques. Something so powerful, it would even be able to free Gojo from the back of the prison realm. The ISO is based on a real Japanese myth about a cursed spear somewhere near the, get this, the Sakurajima Volcano, where Maki and Noritoshi happen to be right now. Before the Culling Games end, will we see Maki find this shard and forge a new weapon to free Gojo herself? I hope so, man. This is the girl boss arc. So we just talked about the inverted Spear of Heaven, but now let's talk about a different weapon of Toji's and its implications for the future real quick. Toji had an incredibly powerful sword, then unnamed, which was also presumably destroyed by Gojo. When Maki's sister Mai sacrificed herself to bring that powerful blade back into existence for her sister, we found out it was called the Soul Liberation Blade, and it can slice through the metaphysical soul of people and objects. To be clear, it completely ignores the toughness or hardness and will slice directly through the soul of its target. This is a weapon that could possibly insta-kill anyone, even Mahito or other very skilled reverse curse technique users and soul protectors. The most interesting thing about it to me is that it's stated to only be possible to wield by people who can quote unquote observe the souls of even inanimate objects. This is hypothetically interesting for two reasons. One, it could maybe open the back of the prison realm, since it presumably is an object with Monk Genshin's soul. And two, as we recently found out, Maki is immune to domains because of her lack of cursed energy. To the domain caster, she is an inanimate object. Just like the floor or a building, she is ignored by the effects of the domain. This could maybe be seen as an allusion to the possibility that Maki will die by the blade of her own sword. Adding this part in just mainly to piss off and spoil the anime onlys because I already warned about the manga spoilers, but Mahito is f***ing dead. I mean heaven now, so sorry I died. After Yuji was about to take the fattest W of his entire career, Kenny here shows up and catches Mahito like all his other little cursed Pokemon. We pretty much know for a fact Mahito will return, because why would Gege not let Yuji kill him if he wasn't going to come back? Yuji will be fighting for his life later in the story, and then out of nowhere in 100 HP, Kenjaku puppeted Mahito will come out of nowhere, and I personally think Yuji will dominate him as a show of his ultimate character growth in the story. Check back in a few years to see if my predictions in this video were right, by the way, I'm curious. So the prison realm is supposedly inescapable, but there is one guaranteed way of getting out. You should kill yourself! Maybe just before our heroes save Gojo, the prison realm will be empty, and in a tragic moment, they'll realize their sensei took his own life. He would then proceed to come back as a vengeful spirit and eviscerate Kenjaku, or whatever these schizo Gojo stands are saying these days. First of all, this would make for a pretty lame plot beat to the story which just doesn't sound like Gege to me, and secondly, Gojo would never do this. The last thing we heard him say was that he confidently has faith in his students and trusts them to free him. Gojo has shown many times to think Yuta and Hikari and even Megami and Yuji will rise up to the task and be stronger than he is. I personally think this theory has just about as much weight as Squidward's suicide, but it does segue nicely into our next, equally dark, but definitely more believable Gojo tragedy theory. As the title says, this theory is that Gojo will end up blind or at the best losing an eye. There have been a couple shots from the anime that seem to foreshadow this, but I think the fact that he always wears a blindfold might be some pretty obvious foreshadowing in and of itself. Pretty soon he may need that thing. This would of course nullify one of Gojo's most powerful abilities, the Six Eyes. We don't really know how this power works, but it's sort of a sixth sense. We know it's incredibly valuable and may even be able to let you deduce curse techniques just by looking at people. Maybe he'll go blind and lose this ability, and the universe balancing it out will grant someone else the six eyes, either a new child or maybe even Yuta or Yuji through some strange scenario. A real monkey wrench in this cool thematic theory though, is that if Gojo loses his eyes, he could just heal them with reverse curse technique. But that's not the only way things get done in JJK. With the way curse techniques counter each other, you'd be surprised what could happen. For instance, Angel and maybe even some other characters have the ability to nullify curse techniques and maybe even cursed energy itself, so if they stabbed Gojo, it would go right through his infinity and he may never be able to heal it. Or what about Takaba? His ability is that whatever he thinks is funny comes true. 
What's stopping him from saying, Teehee, that guy wears a blindfold for no reason. It'd be funny if he was actually blind. W wait! In this entry, we'll be talking about Yuji's mother, Mrs. Itadori. This is an incredibly well-known fact since it was established so long ago in the manga, but that doesn't mean it doesn't belong this low in the iceberg. Plus, it sets up like five things, so pay attention. Yuji's mother, the few times we've seen her, has always had this stitched forehead. This doesn't just mean she's a vessel, but it means she is hosting none other than Kenjaku himself, the evil body-hopping brain. We aren't aware when exactly Kenjaku hopped into this woman's body and stole her life from her, but it's all but confirmed that it was much before the pregnancy, so Kenjaku literally birthed Yuji himself. This is why Yuji has always been unnaturally strong, and why he had the one in a million odds to withstand being Sukuna's vessel, because he was built to do it. Yuji's entire life has been faded and dictated for him. He is just a cog in Kenjaku's machine. He just wanted to help people, but has unwittingly been made the key to unlock a torturous and competitive new era of untold global suffering. We'll definitely get more on this as the story progresses, but this needed to be here. It's one of the most disturbing and ominous situations in the entire story, and one I think will have really crushing further development. Kenjaku at one point even calls Yuji his son, which is interesting to me. Does Kenjaku feel pride for finally creating his masterpiece, or does he actually feel some sort of sick maternal love for Yuji? This could even be Yuji's mother's original personality somehow leaking through and still remaining in some form, but that's kind of unlikely to me. Remember ages ago when I said a later entry would debunk the whole idea that Yuji has memory manipulation powers? This is that entry. Best character tells Yuji during their fight that he has three parents. A mother, a cursed spirit, and Kenjaku. At the time, Kenjaku was residing in the body of Noritoshi Kamo. And no, not that Noritoshi Kamo, I'm talking about the ancient Nazi blood doctor Noritoshi Kamo. Kenjaku had all the cursed wombs made by manipulating their cursed blood while they were still fetal. This failed nine times, which is likely why he abandoned this plan, deciding instead to go through with Operation Mamadori instead. What this all means though is that schizo moment of Choso realizing Yuji is his brother is real, unlike the former confrontation with Toto. They share a parent in Kenjaku and do share a bloodline, truthfully making them bros for life. This theory is sort of an extension of the previous two, stating that hey, if Choso isn't really schizophrenic, maybe Toto isn't either. Maybe they really are brothers, and Toto is secretly Kenjaku's 11th child, after Yuji in the Wombs. Ignoring the legendary band named Yuji in the Wombs, this theory holds very little weight to me. Toto is just actually fucking bonkers, although his family tree is still a mystery. But that's just a different topic. When Fushiguro is fighting Reggie Star and casts out his domain, there's something looming behind him. A bony, organic shape with many thin, nerve-like tendrils. Now seeing biological matter in a domain expansion isn't anything strange. For instance, take Noya's for example. His domain, Temporal Womb Moon Palace, is modeled after a uterus. Now this vaginal domain expansion makes a lot of sense coming from Noya. He's many times shown to be a misogynistic abuser. He hates his mother and sisters and female cousins, and as a curse, even boasts about abusing Mai. All of this womb imagery clearly appears in his domain because of all this gendered rage and ignorance. So what that means is that this thing in Fushiguro's domain surely doesn't just sit there to be a cool centerpiece. So what does it mean? My personal theory is that this is a giant vertebrae, the vertebrae of none other than Maharaga. Please don't make me say his whole name. I don't want to do it. Ugh, okay, fine, but just once. Eight-handled sword divergent Sila Divine General Maharaga is the strongest Shikigami in all of Kaizen. This thing had a chance at beating Sukuna had it survived a little bit longer. Its ability to adapt to any and all phenomena makes it near unkillable. It'll do whatever you do better than you ever could. Megami almost never summons this Shikigami like he does with his others like Divine Dogs or Nue because he cannot tame this thing. But it's sort of implied he might one day. I personally think that as Megami discovers all the Shikigami he can control with his curse technique, and as they one by one die off, slowly combining together just like his two demon dogs, it will build the Maharaga in his domain. Maybe next time he casts the domain, it'll be more of the spine and maybe even some ribs, and in due time, the entire Maharaga skeleton would be there. This could be how Megami gains the power of the strongest Shikigami, making him one of the heaviest hitters in the verse just like Gojo and many others anticipate.
As we descend deeper down the face of this iceberg, less and less light is making it down here. Oh, would you cut that out? This video is beginning to take over my whole life, which means a lot when you're already thousands of years old. So I had to just stop adding entries to this iceberg after a while. If I would have kept going, the video would have just never come out. Hurry up! What do you think I'm paying you for? You don't pay me. But truthfully, there are enough mysteries and theories in JJK for a whole second one of these videos. That would kind of go against my upload philosophy and also demolish my mental health. But hey, if you want to see that, make sure to make all those funny numbers down there go up. Our beloved characters are mostly all wrapped up in something known as the Culling Game right now. There are 10 veils cast over Japan, and inside them is a battle royale of sorcerers to see who will come out on top. Kenjaku is doing this to make everyone suffer, and in turn get massively stronger, because that's what JJK is all about, gaining strength through trauma. Kenjaku made hundreds of binding vows to make the Culling Game happen, which are basically super duper pinky promises in JJK. One of the vows made was that he himself cannot be the game master of the culling games, so the games would still be unbiased. This sounds like it sucks for him, but all he wants is chaos. This means if he dies, the games are still going to continue, so this was never really a big stipulation for the guy. You may also remember that the culling games has a sort of interface. These shikigami are called kogane, and every player in the culling game has one. It tells you the rules, the players, their scores, and so on. When a player has gained 100 points by murderizing people, they can spend those points adding a rule to the culling game. But there are serious limitations to this. This mysterious Game Master is the judge of if these rules get accepted into the games or not. But now look at where that leaves us. Who is the Game Master? Well, one rationale is that it's the Kogane themselves. These little internet-like curses could be the substitute to make the game fair. But where's the pizzazz in that? Let's look at some other possibilities with a bit more flavor. For instance, one punishment in the culling game is technique removal, leading some to believe that Angel is the Game Master since that's sort of her power. Or how about Tengen, someone who we've already been skeptical about? I mean, the strongest barrier user having something to do with these ten giant barriers around Japan? Hmm. Some think it's Yuki. Some even think it's Megami's comatose sister. Like, for real. I personally think it's Meimei, though. Meimei is constantly characterized as literally doing anything for the right price, and it's implied multiple times her and Kenjaku have some sort of uneasy alliance. This is something we've heard in passing quite a few times throughout JJK's runtime, Japan's Big Three Vengeful Spirits. Despite not knowing much about them, there's so much to discuss here. First of all, what is a Vengeful Spirit? Vengeful Spirits are just that, people who come back after death as a curse, with vengeful intent. This is a rare phenomena created out of a lot of specific variables, but most commonly comes from sorcerers being killed without using cursed energy. When someone's death is cursed, it gives them insane power boosts. Rika, the queen of curses, is a vengeful spirit. Noya is a vengeful spirit. These beings are said to have boundless curse energy. So these big three vengeful spirits must be insanely powerful just based on what we know from context clues alone. If that isn't enough to convince you that none of our characters are going to survive this story, vengeful spirits are said to be impossible to exercise. One of the big three is actually a relative of Gojo and Yuta. Sidebar, but Uro says that Yuta is a descendant of the Fujiwara too, making him a relative of TWO of the big three. This dude is cursed as shit, zero chance he gets a happy ending, I'm calling it now. We'll probably see these curses as soon as we learn more about the golden age of sorcery when Tsukuna was still rampaging. The Heian era is still full of mystery, but everything we learn about it continues to completely blow my mind. The soul-body connection in Jujutsu Kaisen is a strange one. They're thought to be two different things, but can affect one another strongly. It's not known which comes first, or which one is stronger. The concept has been in the story ever since the beginning. When Yuji repressed Sukuna, he grabs his own face, holding it in place to restrain the second soul in his body trying to overcome it. We've even seen a soul overcome a body before with the resurrection of Toji Fushiguro. What all this has to do with Kenjaku is that his body is the former body of Suguru Geto, and at one point in the manga, this happens. How are you going to let yourself get used like that, Suguru? Ha <laughs> ha no way! This is a first time for me. Gato. Mahito, look, 
You theorize the soul came before the body, but the body is the soul, and the soul the body. Otherwise, this phenomena of the body's memories entering my mind even after changing the host can't be explained. Gato's brain isn't even in this body and still has some deep-seated internal level of consciousness. With Gage's foreshadowing, this all cannot be for no reason. I think it's pretty obvious that one of two things will happen. During a very pivotal moment in the series, Gato will briefly snap back into consciousness in Kenjaku's body and stop some sort of plan from happening. Number 9 is a 45-page short story that Gege Akutami wrote back in 2015, before Jujutsu Kaisen. It follows a young boy called Nine, who acts as the Yakuza of his neighborhood. Unlike the other Yakuza though, Nine is less into mafia shenanigans and terrorizing the public, and more into achieving balance and maintaining it through mystic abilities. Now mind you, he's not necessarily a hero. He wants to create balance and gain world peace by using chaos and curses, which is a massive theme in JJK. Nine fights by summoning boxes that he can then pull things out of. Nine is really interesting, he's extremely opinionated and driven, hot-headed and sinisterly calm and confident. He reminds me very much of both Gojo and Sukuna. This is how Nine describes the world around him. The world is built on the balance between the back and the front. Life and death, create and destroy, there's two sides to everything. This back and front he's talking about are like different dimensions or parallel universes. The front being their normal environment, and the back being a dark, shadowy void that exists all around them at once, but is undetectable. He goes on to say that the quote-unquote other side of humans are eerie, which are the species of this creature he manifests. It's very similar in nature to a curse, who as we know from JJK, really are just the life forms on the other side, opposite to humans. There are many parallels between this one shot and JJK, and a lot can be gleaned from its existence. Let's move on now, but we'll be talking about this again in like, a minute. I have been crazy excited to talk about this one, The Cursed Realm. From what we've been shown, it works very similar to the aforementioned back from number 9. The Cursed Realm is commonly referred to as the other side, and is a space between dreams and reality. It exists all around us and in the same space as us, but is largely imperceivable for the average person. In my opinion, this black void acts as somewhat of a limbo or purgatory within JJK. The only character we've seen who can actively navigate this realm is Kenjaku, which should tell you something about how difficult it must be to be able to actually perceive it. It most likely took him hundreds or thousands of years of work to be able to find a way in and out of this space, but it clearly has its benefits as we know just how much power and influence Kenjaku really has. Cursed Spirit Noya sees this other side after his death, because he had become a vengeful spirit trapped between the Cursed Realm and our own realm. Just by virtue of this, Noya is said to have BOUNDLESS cursed energy. He's presumably siphoning the energy directly from the Cursed Realm itself, which is apparently why all the Vengeful Spirits are as powerful as they are. Rika and Sukuna included. Perhaps when sorcerers get extraordinarily buffed right before their death like Gojo did, this could be the reason. Right before fading away, when you see the light, it's unknowingly accessing the power of the Cursed Realm. Briefly back to number 9, whenever somebody interacts with the back while in the front, it manifests as liquid. Someone bumps into our main character and suddenly can't breathe, and black bubbles float through the oxygen towards the sky. Let's see if this is true for the Cursed Realm in JJK, and spoiler alert, it very much is. For instance, Gojo creating a veil of black liquid, or Rika emerging from a portal of this same black liquid. Tengen shows the back of the prison realm by pulling it out of a similar hole of black energy. We see this yet again when Gato summons curses. We even see the black bubbles when Maki grazes death. My very favorite justification for all this theorizing is the black flash, which we know is just a flash of black energy, which creates an atmospheric distortion just like being underwater. It seems that this cursed realm is an invisible space that has an opaque black atmosphere that's heavier than oxygen. A black flash is a blow so fast and so hard that it breaks a dimensional barrier, letting some of that dark cursed energy spike through. Barriers, domains, black flashes, it can all be explained using this model of the cursed realm emerge from darkness blacker still. Purify that which is impure. Yeah! Shadow Serene! <laughs> huh? No touches! For this part of the iceberg, let me ask you something. Have you ever stopped to think why Sukuna is so obsessed with Fushiguro? 
Sukuna isn't an easy man to get a compliment from. It took 150% of Jogo's power and his goddamn life for Sukuna to even be a tad bit chivalrous. But he's always been kind to Megami. In Shibuya, he specifically made the size of his domain expansion just small enough to spare him and even saved his life from Maharaga. Keep that in mind. The especially keen-eyed of you out there may have noticed that in this last entry there was something I forgot to bring up. There's a character whose whole identity is pulling from the back and using black liquid cursed energy. That's right, Megumi. Perhaps the reason Gojo says Fushiguro will surpass him one day and the reason Sukuna and Angel are so interested in Megumi is because he can harness the cursed realm. Megumi's domain while being unfinished is a writhing ocean of this black shadowy void. I suppose these could be two separate voids, but it just doesn't seem likely to me. Megumi will become a shadow god, roamer of the void, and will be the first user to master black flashes and second to navigate the cursed realm. Just you wait, I'm calling it now. We've talked quite a few times now about this fight between Jogo and Sukuna where he straight up disrespects this man. Sukuna straight up tells Jogo he'll come help him with whatever he needs as long as he can land a single hit on him. Jogo pulls out all the stops but ends up picking his jaw up off the floor, sweating and scared. After Jogo tries to use his maximum meteor technique on him and fails miserably, Sukuna decides to flex on Jogo and kill him using fire. Fire that's even stronger than his somehow. This is a total shock to Jogo as he, like us, was under the impression that slicing and slashing was Sukuna's technique, not this extraordinarily powerful arrow of hellfire strong enough to even vaporize him instantly. Before Sukuna can access these fire abilities though, he chants something aloud, a summoning spell of sorts. Black Box Open. Now we don't know what he literally says or if Black Box is just some sort of sensor, like Sukuna said something so otherworldly that we can't even perceive it correctly. Either way, this is definitely in reference again to Gege's previous work number 9. If you remember, 9 fights using boxes that he pulls and summons weapons from, like this bow for example. We just saw Sukuna pull this flaming imaginary bow out of a metaphysical box, but other than this one incident, this is all sort of up in the air. We haven't gotten any other details about this yet. For people like me who love lore and world building mechanics, curse techniques are a treasure trove. Whenever meeting a new character, theorizing about the technicalities behind their abilities is always the first step. Even characters we've known forever like Yuji, Nobara, Yuta, their curse techniques are shrouded in mystery and details have been drip fed to us over the course of the last 4-5 to five years. So it's no mystery that the King of Curses himself is at the center of all this speculation. Nobody really knows just how Sukuna's abilities work because of how strong he is. He's never had to use his real strength, breezing through every conflict he's been in. But his destructive capabilities are immense and we know he's much, much stronger than he lets on. This entry, in its simplest form, is just the implications of the black box open incident. If Sukuna can also control fire, or maybe he just has this one fire arrow attack, how many other techniques does he have? What allows him to have multiple, and did these techniques he's using used to belong to other living beings? I know every topic in this tier of the iceberg has pretty much been one long thing, but let's take it a little bit further with this next entry. This is what I'm going to call one of the leading theories for what Sukuna's technique is currently in the community. Quick shout out to this person, time is cool and good, because I'm realizing they wrote a lot of these posts I'm referencing, like this one about Sukuna's CT. This post is simple, they posit Sukuna's tech is just what we believe it to be. Destruction. To slice things into pieces. But this is so simple, if this is all his abilities are, why can he do all this weird stuff we've seen him do, and why does his original form look like that? Time is Cool and Good theorizes that this is the doing of his reversal technique. Keep in mind, this is not reverse curse technique like healing, which Sukuna has also perfected, it's full technique reversal. For those of you who need a refresher, reversals are the exact opposite of your abilities and are incredibly difficult to achieve, often only coming to those with total mastery over themselves and their cursed energy. So this is kind of confusing, but let me break it down. Very few sorcerers can use positive energy or blessed energy to heal instead of destroy, but this energy by nature is the antithesis to cursed energy. So if when you use your technique, you fuel it with positive energy instead of negative energy, it results in a technique reversal, the opposite of your normal skill set. Like how Gojo's limitless ability allows him to basically create and manipulate black holes with his ability blue, his technique reversal, dubbed red, repels instead of attracts, the total opposite. 
Gojo can then even combine these abilities to create purple, implying he's using both types of energy at once. Now if there's any other sorcerer who has this level of mastery, it's gotta be Sukuna, right? We know from multiple context clues that Sukuna is the best user of RCT. He accidentally heals Yuji like twice because he's so good at healing, he actively has to suppress it from happening to fuck with Yuji. Sukuna is always on about how people don't know anything about real Jujutsu, and how curses are lowly. Perhaps he thinks this way because curses can't use RCT. Think about it, if Sukuna's technique is slicing, dismantling, cleaving things apart, then his reversal would almost surely be joining and fusing things together. Which lines up perfectly with what we know about him being the best reverse curse technique user of all time. Moth milk? Are you kidding me? I want moth milk! You know, one time me and the boys were out having a mystical and wizarding smoke sesh out in the woods, and Monk Genshin showed up and actually gave me one of these things. I'm gonna need it to protect myself in case that my hemorrhoid kid comes back. I really want to say during my last intermission here that I really appreciate you watching. When this script was in its infancy, I had an 100 subscriber thanks planned, and now I'm approaching quadruple that. I know in most people's grand mindset of the internet, YouTubers all have millions of subs, but I am legitimately blown away by this steadily growing number every single day. 400 people is nothing to scoff at. Imagine 400 people choosing to- OH MY GOD LOOK IT JUST HAPPENED! LOOK LOOK! Okay. Imagine 400 people choosing to come sit down and give their full attention to something you made for an hour or longer. And these aren't even views, these are people that liked it enough to get notified when I come out with more. That right there is truly special, no matter how ordinary. Thank you all for enjoying the show, and let's not wait any longer to get into the deathly alluring pitch black depths that inspired me to make this video in the first place. Too much? The bomb. This refers to the many references to a bomb that would be dropped on the culling game at some point. Kenjaku's current known goal is to make the whole world a Mad Max paradise of powerful beings doing whatever they want and getting stronger and stronger through chaos. This means this bomb could be any number of things. In recent chapters, Kenjaku has been meeting up with foreign leaders like the Chinese and United States government and showing them just how much of a threat cursed energy is. This forced global conflict may be the metaphorical bomb, as soldiers will invade the calling game. Perhaps sparking a real war is part of his plan, and more of a literal bomb will be used. Maybe releasing Sukuna is the bomb, as he's been referred to one previously. Or maybe it will be something totally unexpected and even more sinister, like a disaster curse born from the fear of war itself. All this means is that shit will hit the fan very soon, sooner than later. So this theory is another one about Sukuna. Hope you guys aren't tired of hearing about that guy yet, because he's kinda super fucked up and mysterious, so he lives on this iceberg rent-free like the cheat bastard he is. His domain is said to be divine, and his domain is even a shrine. Is he borrowing a deity's power, or is he the deity? The hand sign Sukuna does to activate his domain is the Buddhist hand sign for Enma, the lord of death and hell. In Buddhism, hell isn't one, but many. There are different layers of hell, both hot and cold. The eight major hells are as follows. Thoughts, Black Rope, Crushing, Moaning, Great Moaning, Burning, Great Burning, and Unremitting. These eight hells could be Sukuna's abilities, and to be honest, we only really need to look at the first one. Just inside the first hell, Thoughts, there are 16 smaller hells. Black Sand, Boiling Excrement, 500 Nails, Hunger, Thirst, Single Copper Cauldron, Many Copper Cauldrons, Stone Pestle, Pus and Blood, Measuring Fire, Ash River, Iron Pellets, Axes and Hatchets, Jackals and Wolves, Sword Cuts, and finally, Coal and Ice. It may just sound like I'm listing all the ingredients for a perfect Sunday morning, but let me call out three of those that I find not really interesting but familiar. Sword Cuts, Axes and Hatchets, and measuring fire. Perhaps Sukuna is the personification or reincarnation of Enma, the Lord of Hell, and wields the power of thoughts, which means he has 16 different hellish curse techniques. Remember the useless Miwa entry all the way back in Tier 1? Well here's a theory about that, and I don't know if I wholeheartedly believe it or if it has zero merit, it's somewhere there. 
So in chapter 143, Miwa talks about how when she was younger, her mom would always dye her hair black to hide her crazy blue natural color. She's also been seen roaming the culling games in the same deadlock colony as Yuta. How is she even still alive if this colony has deadlocked into only being the toughest sorcerers? Well, this theory posits that Miwa is a vessel or reincarnation of a strong ancient sorcerer, and that's why her hair is a bright blue color, and that's why she's still alive in the culling game. Other vessels we've seen like Yuji and Kashimo also have bright hair. I don't exactly know the plausibility of this, but I have no other reason for the importance of her hair. Geike brought that up for a reason. Perhaps she could be some weird other variant like a star plasma vessel? What do you guys think? So have you ever wondered why in JJK all this crazy shit with curses only ever happens in Japan? Well the in-universe explanation that we've gotten for this is basically because of Tengen's barrier over Japan. But there are definitely sorcerers overseas. For instance, Yuta goes to find African sorcerers, which is why he's gone a majority of the series. And I think it's been stated before that Momo's father was an American sorcerer. Because it's confirmed that cursed energy exists in other places of the world, and piggybacking off of the fact that Gege constantly references Japanese mythology, we can kind of imply that mythology in other places of the world may be contextually real as well. Just how much global mythology is real within JJK though? Was King Arthur an ancient sorcerer with a legendary cursed tool, Excalibur? Were Greek and Roman gods some of the most powerful sorcerers known to man? It can be really fun to look at these mythological stories we have in real life and put them through a Jujutsu Kaisen lens. Watch the real Jesus Christ show up at the end of the Culling Games and kill Sukuna. Yuki Sukumo is someone we know shockingly little about, but her importance cannot be understated. She's one of the only four special grade sorcerers we're aware of, alongside powerhouses such as Suguru Geto, Yuta Okotsu, and of course Satoru Gojo. But despite her name being up there with the most prolific wizards of all time, we still don't know her powers. Let's try to figure out what it could be through nothing more than context clues. So there's something in Japanese folklore called Sukugogami, and they're inanimate objects that have souls. Not every object has a soul, but most gain one right as they turn 100. The first half of this word, Sukumo, means both old and 99, this word being Yuki's last name. Explained by Kenjaku in chapter 203, the abilities needed to qualify for a special grade is someone who can overthrow a country single-handedly. Gojo obviously, but Geto was a special grade because of his threat of him being able to create a massive army of cursed spirits. This threat of making an army, a world-changing ability, is exactly what was discussed later when talking about Yaga's abilities. If he could create an army of cursed corpses, he would have been special grade. Because of the comparison between Geto and Yaga, I and many others have come to the conclusion that her ability is to animate inanimate objects. This fits into the making an army thing which would solidify her as a special grade and fits with everything we know about her so far. There's likely a stipulation where she can only animate objects over 100 years old or something. She can probably feel the emotions of objects and is always seen traveling because she's in search of artifacts. This headcanon fits like a glove and I can't think of anything to disprove it so far. Hey, this is a Jalamoth in my 100th hour of editing coming in to tell you that her power is actually that she can just punch people really hard. In chapter 185, we get to know a little bit more about Panda's story. The chapter opens with an image of three ihai, which are memorial tablets, basically little gravestones. Earlier in the story, Principal Yaga was shown to have resurrected a young boy into a cursed corpse. How much this curse actually retained the personality of its original self is sort of vague, but definitely is lesser. Panda is also a cursed corpse, but is shockingly more conscious than this little bear thing or any of Yaga's other stuffies. He states this is because you need three highly compatible souls in one body, constantly observing each other to achieve this state. With all this information, this inference is pretty clear. These Ihai are memorializing Yaga's dead children. The three highly compatible souls needed are these three triplets, the same three cores that reside within Panda. Let me clear that up in case it wasn't clear. Panda is an amalgamation of three stillborn babies' innocent souls, which is perhaps why Panda seems to feel detached from humanity entirely. Fuck the people that call this a typical shonen. What is that? 
You're not going to see Chopper being made of stillborn babies. Megumi might be sort of unlucky sometimes, but surely not doomed, right? Well, if you've learned anything from this video, it's that nothing in JJK exists for no reason. There's not a single text bubble of filler in this entire saga. Nearly everything is enticing exposition or a purposeful clue. Which is exactly why my heart sank into my stomach at the conclusion of Megami and Reggie's fight. When Reggie utters his final words, he says, Can you do me a favor? After all, you've killed me. Let fate toy with you, become a clown, and then die. Just like everything else in Kaizen, it hasn't really been fully explored, but your last spoken words have an incredible magnitude on the fate of those around you. Like when Nanami makes sure not to accidentally curse Yuji with his final words. What Reggie seems to do here is a genuine attempt to curse Megumi so that he not only fails, but is toyed with and clowned. The next time we see Megumi, he's being carried away by the angel. Takaba sees this and yells, Patrash! which is a reference to the story called Dog of Flanders. In this story, a boy and his dog are scooped up and flown away by little angels. The tale ends with the bodies of the boy and his dog found frozen under a tree, a scary ending which echoes Fushiguro's cursed fate. To make matters worse, when Megami wakes up, Hana immediately calls him her fated one. Will she be the one to toy with him and lead his destiny to ruin? This one is what I would call a compounding theory. A lot of little substantial evidence comes together to show a pretty strange but reasonable connection. Sukuna and Tengen could possibly be twins of some kind. We've talked about the soul body connection before, but what we haven't gone in depth on is that this mechanism makes twins in this universe utterly broken. I don't want to go into too much detail because this video is already really long and I honestly don't even fully understand it, but we know from Mai and Maki that in the world of JJK, twins are cursed and it's because of how it tampers with this soul-body connection. It's like being recognized as two souls within one body. This could totally cripple both twins, or in exceedingly rare cases, lead to massive buffs. I'll speak more on this later, but it's pretty much proven that Sukuna is a twin, more specifically a conjoined twin. He either absorbed his twin and gained the power of two souls, or some other black magic fuckery is going on here. Being some sort of conjoined twin would be an answer to how Sukuna had four arms, or at least that this twin aspect was a curse that manifested itself by duplicating his arms. Same with his eyes, Sukuna has four eyes despite being referred to as a human multiple times. The only other human character with four eyes being Tengen. They're both over a thousand years old, and Sukuna's barrierless domain could even be explained via Tengen's barrier existing all over Japan. The only wrench in this plan is that it's stated Tengen is 200 or so years older than Sukuna, but this could be a red herring. Either way, this thumb lady still really scares me. The seasons of the year is something that seems to hold a quiet yet ever-present weight over this series. The story begins in June, Japan's first summer month. Panda explains early in the story that because of the emotion-based way that curses manifest, winter seasonal depression causes a massive surge of curses later in the year. Once you start paying attention to this theme of annual change, you start to realize that it's everywhere. For instance, we see a ton of marine life through JJK which is almost always seen during the animal season of breeding, like the sea angel mentioned in chapter 1 whose mating period is around that time. This attention to detail is telling us just how much the importance of the seasons hold to Gege and in extension, their work. Let's talk about the culling game, which in Japanese is Shimetsu Kayu. Shimetsu translating to extinction or annihilation, and Kayu being seasonal migration or round trip, which are words often used when talking about marine life. Kenjaku even calls the sorcerers Aisha, being a double meaning for both player and swimmer. What we can gather from this is that Jujutsu Kaisen has themes of death, change, and rebirth, all correlating closely to the seasons. On the topic of death and rebirth, Sukuna was reborn in summer, but he isn't what makes this interesting. Yuji is, being a man who's died twice, firstly in the summer at the hand of Sukuna, and his second death and subsequent rebirth at the hands of Yuta in the fall. If you're still with me here, what this is all trying to get at is that Yuji may die four times. His winter death most likely being as a result of the culling game, which as we've discussed is basically a new year's party. It appears the spring, the time of growth and birth, will be where Yuji faces his fourth and most likely final end. 
Some may disagree with how low I put this relatively low simple concept, but here we have the consequences to breaking a binding vow. We've never seen this happen before, and we don't know any of the specifics. What we do know once again, when making a deal with Mekamaru, Kenjaku and Mahito realize they need to uphold their end of the deal because the alternative is just too risky. Kenjaku has been around for thousands of years and knows almost everything there is to currently know about sorcery, and yet going up against a binding vow has consequences so cruel and unpredictable that it scares even him straight. So what could this penalty be? I think that during a core moment in this odyssey, a binding vow will be broken, and we will see the full wrath of misfortune unleashed. The reason this entry is so low is simply because of the implication. Some of you may know the text and image board 4chan, but what you may not know is that it was an imitation of a Japanese forum called 2chan, originally 2channel. And on this platform, just like any other, horror stories and urban legends were spread like wildfire. This was back around 2000, so these creepy stories were basically proto-creepypastas. During an interview, Akutami said that Sukuna was based primarily on an urban legend of this sort. And while he didn't say which one, there is a 2chan thread from 2005 referred to as Mononobe Tengoku sometimes going by Ryomen Sukuna. This story coincidentally takes place in Akutami's hometown of the Aiwate Prefecture, and the thread follows a construction worker who finds and opens a box containing the mummified corpse of a conjoined twin. Two heads, four arms, two legs. Some priests claim all the construction workers who found the artifact at the temple are cursed and will die. Surely enough, all the anonymous poster's co-workers start to die mysteriously one by one. The body that was in this coffin was once a living conjoined twin, who was bought from a freak show by a man named Mononobe Tengoku. Because of Mononobe's strange obsession with these conjoined twins, he went down into the basement one night and snapped, stabbing everyone but the twins. He then left and locked the door behind him, leaving the twins to starve. He came back only once they had died and mummified their corpse. He did this to make it as traumatic as possible and then began conducting rituals with the corpse. In JJK terms, he was just trying to make the most powerful cursed object possible. He even filled the mummy's stomach with a fine powder made of the crushed bones of the past traitors from ancient clans. He then took this thing all over the country, and who would have thought, coincidentally, every major disaster in Japan took place directly after he arrived. This urban legend is a wild ride, and I glossed over quite a few details, but as a JJK fan, this story seems damn near familiar. Obviously the twin being called Ryom and Sukuna, but the fact that Sukuna being a twin confirms so many other theories mean this story does have weight. So are there other features of this creepypasta that will eventually make their way into JJK? I personally think Kenjaku's horrible experiments while in the body of Noritoshi Kamo were inspired by Tengoku, but the Mononobe clan is theorized to make an entrance in the series at some point. This story is so interesting no matter its relevance to Jujutsu Kaisen. It clearly inspired it, so it belongs here regardless. Sukuna's origin story will change this entire saga. We'll see how much overlap there is with the Mononobe Tengoku legend at the end of Jujutsu Kaisen. I'm not too keen on this whole outro thing, so I'm not even going to script this, but thank you all so much for watching, especially this late in the video. If you got to this point, I mean, come on, it had to have been some kind of engaging, you might as well like and subscribe, or at least comment, I mean, I'm gonna respond. I don't have too much else to say, but to finish it out, if you like the music in this video, I'll put a track list in the description. If you want other anime content, I have a Cowboy Bebop video and an Attack on Titan video that's criminally underrated. If you made it this far in the video and I spoiled all of JJK for you because you haven't read it. I'm extremely disappointed in you. Go read it right now, please. I've been your host, Jalimov, and I'll see you next time.